Thank you for visiting United Red England's YouTube channel. Today we're going to talk about idiopathic facial paralysis, which is also known as Bell's palsy. We're going to talk about the Bell's palsy diagnosis. We're going to talk about how we could potentially add dry needling to the management of Bell's palsy. In order to do that, you need to understand all the precautions associated with needling the face. And then we'll give a demonstration for electrical dry needling and Bell's palsy's management. Please like this video and please subscribe to the channel by clicking that little red button right down there. Thank you. Bell's palsy is the most common condition involving a rapid and unilateral onset of peripheral paresis and paralysis of the seventh cranial nerve. It affects about 11 to 53 per 100,000 individuals every year. It's actually the most acute, uh, the most frequent acute mononeuropathy with partial or incomplete ability to move the affected side's facial muscles. It typically resolves within weeks to months, but sometimes approximately 25% of the patients are going to have a facial asymmetry that continues to persist. After onset, the paralysis and paresis usually reaches its maximum severity within about 72 hours of initial symptoms. You know, the etiology isn't very clear about Bell's palsy, but there's five generally accepted theories of uh, what's causing it. So there's an anatomical theory, viral infection, ischemia, inflammation, and then cold stimulation, kind of randomly. But for the anatomical theory, the cranial nerve 7 has a long, and it's got a convoluted pathway, and it's got lots of branches, so it's going to make it more susceptible to palsy than any other, any other nerve in the body, just because of the, the weird and crazy path that cranial nerve 7 takes. Uh, viral infection is also a theory. Uh, they assume that it's a reactivated viral infection, such as the shingles virus, the varicella zoster, and then certain types of, of herpes viruses as well. And then ischemia, such as in certain conditions like diabetes mellitus, uh, primary ischemia neuropathy can occur, and that can also affect cranial nerve 7 and then give you a result in facial, uh, idiopathic facial paralysis. Inflammation, uh, sometimes acute inflammation can cause demyelinization, so that's another theory. And then cold stimulation, which is kind of random, but uh, studies have shown a clear correlation that exists between cold temperatures and cases of uh, Bell's palsy that's been observed. Peripheral nerve palsy is distinguished from central facial palsy. So central facial palsy could occur like due to a stroke, and it's all differentiated by its involvement of the frontalis muscle. So in the, if the frontalis muscle functions properly, but the middle and lower portions of the face are affected, the lesion is probably centrally mediated, meaning that it's supranuclear, so meaning that it would be like a stroke. The facial nerve nucleus innervating the frontalis muscle receives afferent input from both the cerebral hemispheres, and it keeps functioning, it keeps, uh, functioning normally in a unilateral central lesion. So it's kind of interesting to consider how uh, just the action of the frontalis muscle can help you differentiate between facial paralysis caused by a stroke or facial paralysis caused by Bell's palsy. Uh, typically with Bell's palsy, your frontalis is not going to work. And with a stroke, your frontalis should still work because you have a unilateral insult from the CVA and your frontalis has a bilateral dual hemispheric innervation. So even if one side of your uh, hemisphere is screwed up from a stroke, then the frontalis should still function. So it's just kind of interesting. Some of the characteristic features of peripheral facial nerve palsy includes a lack of forehead wrinkling, low eyebrow protrusion, so you have that eyebrow ptosis, incomplete eyelid closure, a drooping corner of the mouth, and then a flattened nasolabial fold. The severity of facial nerve palsy is rated on a six-point House and Brackman scale. So grade one would be the, the least severe. That's going to correspond to a normal facial nerve function. And then grade six would be the most severe, and that's going to correspond to a complete facial paralysis. There's a little bit of conflicting evidence on the effectiveness of facial exercises and massage for treatment of peripheral facial nerve palsy. Uh, one study uh, in this person's 2011 systematic review did find statistically significant improvements with exercise for Bell's palsy. A little bit of information about electroacupuncture. So electroacupuncture was found to be more effective than normal acupuncture for treatment of Bell's palsy and was found to decrease inflammatory factors, improve blood flow, and potentially facilitate remyelination. A release of CGRP, so that's calcitonin gene-related peptide, was found to be significant during electroacupuncture, which can cause vasodilation, and it can also increase blood flow, and that can contribute to tissue healing as well. Since electrical dry needling can stimulate neuromuscular junctions and targeted tissue, it may initiate vasodilation better than manual dry needling. Therefore, it may be more advantageous for nerve generation and healing, as opposed to just manually needling uh, somebody's face when they have Bell's palsy. Uh, the study by Zhang in 2012 found a daily session of electroacupuncture for three weeks led to significant remyelination of axons and increased number of organelles compared to the control group in 60 rabbits with intentionally injured facial nerves. So Zhang intentionally injured the facial nerves of 60 rabbits and then he uh, put them in two groups. He had a control group and a treatment group. In the treatment group, he performed electroacupuncture uh, daily for three weeks and he found increased remyelination 
of axons and then an increased number of organelles in that group that had electroacupuncture as opposed to the group that did not. So for Bell's palsy, uh, Mayer, back in 2007, recommended initiating treatment with a low frequency electrical stimulation. So two to four hertz with low intensity uh, sensory stimulation, followed by an increase to a motor level stimulation for 15 to 20 minutes if the patient can tolerate, tolerate it. So you can start with a low sensory stimulation and uh, as the patient can tolerate, then you can get into more of a motor stimulation where you actually see the, the muscles contract with the electrical stimulation. While a muscle motor treatment strategy is likely important, the literature suggests that the use of electrical dry needling or electrical acupuncture prior to facial exercises may be effective for treating the symptoms associated with the Bell's palsy. So now we'll look at some of the potential uh, treatments to that that we can use for dry needling in the management of Bell's palsy. Of course, in order to do that, you need to understand all the precautions that uh, you need to be aware of when you're going to needle uh, the face. So uh, certainly that includes the branches of the facial nerve, some of the uh, neurovascularity all on the side of the face as well. So we'll talk about those. This demonstration is intended as a resource for previous students and licensed clinicians who can perform dry needling in their practice acting jurisdiction. Please do not attempt dry needling without proper licensure and training. The facial artery and vein traverses across the mandible just inferior and anterior to the insertion of the masseter, and the parotid gland covers the posterior aspect of the masseter. The facial nerve has a large nerve root, and then it branches into all these different branches. You have a temporal branch, a zygomatic branch, a buccal branch, and a marginal mandibular branch. And you just need to be aware of all the continuations of the facial nerve as you're needling anywhere near the side of the face. On the side of the scalp, you need to be concerned about the frontal and parietal branches of the superficial temporal artery and vein. These arteries are extracranial, and they're discontinuations of the external carotid artery, but they're certainly a concern when you're needling the temporalis on the lateral aspect of the skull. And also, you need to be concerned about cranial nerve 5, which is a trigeminal nerve. The mandibular branch of cranial nerve 5 runs deep to the zygomatic arch. It's deep to the inferior head of the lateral goid, and it's anterior to the mandibular notch. In this picture, the mandible has been removed. You can see the... Uh, inferior head of the lateral pterygoid is faded light blue, the superior head of the lateral pterygoid is intact, and that's just right underneath the zygomatic arch. And then of course you can also see all the branches of the facial nerve, which includes the temporal branch, the uh, buccal branch, the zygomatic branch, the mar marginal mandibular branch. And uh, you can see the trigeminal nerve just deep to the inferior head of the lateral pterygoid. For a more in-depth demonstration, please see the demonstration videos for each muscle on our YouTube channel. Special thanks to Dr. Morgan Alford, a uh, physical therapist and former student, for allowing us to shoot this demonstration video. Thanks, Morgan. As with all dry needling techniques, it is important to use a clean technique that includes using gloves and an alcohol wipe down prior to performing any type of needling. For the orbicularis oculi, you grasp the area of the eyebrow and lift the orbicularis oculi and you tap your needle in and just insert the needle into the tissue between your fingers. When needling the frontalis, you'll treat this technique the same as you do for temporalis. You'll tap the needle in, and then you can uh, needle it directly by just going to the skull, or you can try to kind of slide underneath the skin into the frontalis muscle by traversing across the front part of the patient's skull. The temporalis, this is a technique you're familiar with if you've taken our courses, you can tap this needle in directly into the lateral aspect of the skull. You can go directly in, or you can kind of also slide underneath the skin. For the inferior head of the lateral pterygoid, you'll find the zygomatic arch and just treat inferior to it. I'm being a little more superficial with this technique than I am typically when I'm treating for TMJ. For the masseter, again identify the mandible and you'll just tap this needle in and drive the needle directly into the mandible. For orbicularis oris, you treat it just like you do for orbicularis oculi. You just grasp the tissue between your fingers of the lip and you'll uh, insert the needle kind of superficially into the tissue that's in between your fingers. And then as you can see with electrical stimulation, we've got frontalis and orbicularis oculi hooked up, we've got temporalis with inferior head of the pterygoid hooked up, and we have masseter connected with orbicularis oris.